What is up, people? Happy Tuesday. Hello, hello, hello. I got I to gotta point this one out. Dave, I'm glad the Nutsack fan went well. I'm glad. That is the major key. If you missed the show last week, people, you know, you just got to you, you get a really good, powerful, directional fan. I linked one in the description of the, the video. You point it at your balls, and that's it's, – it's a good summer. It's a beautiful summer after that. I, I highly, highly recommend it, okay? Balls are, you know – hoo-ha region <laughs> if you're a female dj i guess but more particularly i feel like balls get hotter anyway i don't know why i'm starting off the show like this hello welcome happy tuesday it's been quite the eventful weekend lots to talk about today i'm very excited that you're all here i appreciate you all for coming as usual and uh we're, we're gonna get right into it people uh so me and santi had three weddings and i did a brunch in philly so it was like a four-day weekend for me um basically thursday we were at rock island I look very stupid in this picture, but it was a great time. Great wedding. Shouts to that couple. Friday, we were at the Grove at Centerton in South Jersey. Super, super, super fun wedding. And then on Saturday, um, we were down in Delaware at a place called the Chase Center. And we had a larger wedding. It was over 300 people at this wedding, and that was also a great time. So uh, lots to talk about uh, about all of these things. And um, yeah. You know, let, 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 let's let's jump right into it. First, I want to talk about some song requests, okay? Or difficult song requests, you would say. That's kind of annoying. Why did this right? There was supposed to be right actual here. There we go. See that? That was supposed to be centered. Sorry about that. <laughs> difficult song requests. So picture it, right? You got a wedding coming up and you know you're going over stuff and they throw you something that seems to be more difficult now some djs might call these bad song requests okay i hear this often right oh got the worst song requests for this wedding oh these requests suck they're not gonna work they suck right i disagree with saying that like i just think it's wrong because you got to realize like music is subjective and your crowd might vibe to a song that you think sucks. You know what I mean? Like just because you think it sucks or because it's not something that's commonly played or something that's proven or something, even if you listen to the song and you're like, this will never work, you know, you might be right or you might be wrong. Regardless, they want to hear it. Like, you know what I mean? You got to think it gets subjective. You know, I can't tell you how many times I got a song request and I'm like, Oh my God, this is going to suck so bad, but whatever. I got to play it, you know, and, and I went and I played it and ended up being one of the best songs of the night. Because how do you know what their favorite song was with all their friends back in the day in high school or college or whatever? How do you know that shit? You don't know, okay? You don't know. They are giving you valuable information. They're essentially giving you a handicap by telling you these songs that you would never play in a million years, right? So value them. Think of them from that perspective because you'd be surprised what you run into, you know? And I really, I want to drive that point home because... I'm sure I've done it in the past in my like early age, you know, in my early years of DJing. And I'm sure other DJs have done this or do this where you get a really, you know, what you would call a quote unquote bad song request. You don't play it at all. You avoid it because you think it's not going to work. And, you know, either worst case scenario, you get a bad review or they're like, hey, you know, we're really upset you didn't play that. Or they ask you last minute, like, hey, can you play this now? Because you never played it. Now you're playing it out of when you shouldn't be playing it and it doesn't work or whatever. Or, you know, you just missed out on one of the greatest songs of the night. It would have been awesome. So I want to give you guys some tips on how to incorporate difficult song requests. Okay. Song requests that are a little more challenging for us DJs. Uh, so you can, you know, reap the rewards, whether it's in the form of a, the review where they say, oh, he played everything. He was the best. He played all my requests. Or you play the song and it goes off at the wedding and you're really happy you did. Okay? So let's talk about this. Number one, you got to know the when and how. So when I'm planning a wedding with a couple, go through their song requests, da, da, da. If something jumps out at me, I'm going to ask them the when and how. Hey, I saw you put this on here. Um, You know, did you, you know... Did you want this during dinner, right? Did you want this during dancing? Like, when do you think this would fit best in the night? Like, when were you envisioning hearing this song, okay? Always, always ask that. Now, some DJs might say, well, you're setting yourself up for failure because, well, you know, th they might say, well, play it during dancing when it's not really a dancing song. Why ask, you know? Just kind of like, you know, better to ask for forgiveness 
than permission kind of thing because you're kind of setting yourself up. But I disagree with that because when couples request songs, they do have in their head, whether you think it's accurate or not, they have in their head when they would like to hear it. You know what I mean? So it's going to hit different at a certain time of night, especially if they envision the song playing at a certain time. I can't tell you how many times I've had a song request and I'm like, oh God, I hope it's not for dancing. But uh, when did you want me to play this song for dancing? I'm like, oh. But that's when they wanted it. If I would have played that during dinner, they would have came up to me potentially and been like, yo, why are you playing this right now? Like, Save this for later. Or, or come, can you play this a little later? So you end up playing it for dinner for no reason and you end up playing it later anyway. And then now you're caught with your pants down because you don't have a plan on how to play this song later. You know, ask them and take their advice. They want it when they, the customer's always right. They hired you, okay? So ask them. Now, once you know, Actually, I'm not going to jump ahead, okay? When you ask them, if it happens to be a song that, you know, you think would work better during dinner, you think it's going to kind of be tough for dancing, there's nothing wrong with suggesting to them, like, hey, you know, like when you ask them, kind of frame it in a way where, hey, you wanted this song playing during dinner, right? <laughs> right? I'm assuming dinner for this one, you know, you can frame it that way. Yeah, but... We're talking about a request, like, if it's a request that, like, it's a jam with all their friends, da-da-da, but it's, like, a dud to you or whatever, they're going to want it for dancing. Like, you know what I mean? That's when they're going to want it. So, like, you might think it's a dud and think it'll work better for dinner, but, like, that's why you ask. They say during dancing, it's going to be like, oh, shit, how am I going to do this? But at least you know now. At least you can, like, game plan, okay? And that brings me to the next term. So, there's basically, I break song requests up into three different categories, and based on the three different categories, that's how I judge, you know, how I'm going to work it in to a dance set. Okay. So this is in the scenario where you have a difficult song request that they want to be played during dancing. We're not going to talk about dinner and all that. Obviously you just play a song during dinner, piece of cake, right? You play a song for a slow dance. Okay. Here's a slow dance dedicated to so-and-so, whatever you play it out. Right. But they want this song played during dancing. So we'll start with a week, right? If the song is weak, I had one. This past weekend, okay, I'm not going to tell you which wedding, but this weekend, I had a request for Home by Philip Phillips, okay? I'm going to make this day my home, oh, 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 right? You get it? You remember that song? The dude was on like American Idol or some shit, I think. Maybe what? I don't know. It doesn't matter. It was, it was a hit. It was on the radio. Is it a dance song? No. No. Weak. Weak in my opinion, okay? Very just chill kind of like drinking a drink on a beach type song. I don't know. Not really like a, a upbeat. It is in the 120 BPM range, but it's not like, you know, four on the floor kind of like, oh man, I can't wait to hit my two step to the song. Okay. Difficult. Weak. If it's a weak song like that, I highly recommend you end your set with it. Okay. This past weekend had a request for a home by Philip Phillips it was for the uh, one of the parents, and I was, you know, she was, please announce it. Try and do it. I said, um, when do you want me to play it? During dancing. And then they specifically said, can you just play it during, like, the first set? Dedicate it to so-and-so parent, whatever. You know, okay, no problem. I got you. So what I did was my first set, I made it my last song of that first set. Because when I dropped the song, obviously, a couple people left. And we're like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> We gone. <laughs> time to get a drink or time to go to the bathroom. And I was ending the set anyways, right? So, you know, if it's weak, you end your set with it, particularly the first set too. Like for me, you know, depending on the timeline and whatnot, but when once you get into the later sets, you're kind of going to the end of the night. So, you know, I guess you could do it as your last song before you play another slow song if you're breaking things up or before you're doing another formality. Definitely works best though. First set, you're about to go into dinner. I'm also assuming you guys dancing before dinner. Regardless, at the end of your set, drop that bitch in. You might lose a few people, but you make the dedication. The person the song is for runs out or is already out there. They have their song. They have their moment. You can also play it for longer, too, right? If you play in the middle of the set, you're going to really feel your hand shaking because you want to get it out real quick, you know, because it's like bombing your whole shit and messing up, so you're more likely to mix out quicker. Play it at the end. I played almost the whole thing. They got their moment. We kept it pushing. It didn't mess me up, okay? Well, let's say... It's not a weak song, okay, but it's a difficult request and it's traditional. Traditional is the opposite of a weak request as far as when I think you should play it, in my opinion, okay? Now, traditional could be a horror, right? Like if it's a Jewish wedding, a horror, or 
Maybe it's a, a traditional Portuguese song, okay? Also happened to me this weekend. I had two Portuguese songs to play. Um, but to pay, but to pay, but to pay. I don't know if you're from Portugal or if you had a Portuguese wedding, you would know that. Or Brazil, I don't know. I'm not cultured enough to even tell you anything about these songs. All I know is they're given to me and I play them. <laughs> Regardless, I had two Portuguese songs. I asked them, uh, you know, I knew they were, so we're going to play these during dancing, right? Yeah, 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 we're going to play them during dancing. I was like, should I do them back to back or you want them spread out? That's a good question to ask when you have traditional stuff, right? A lot of times they'll say, oh, well, there's two of them, you know, playing back to back. So this weekend they said play them back to back, play them at some point. Now, this is a difficult thing for, you know, a lot of us or all of us because, like, you know, it's it's traditional. You don't play this all the time. You know, you're kind of anticipating that, like, a large majority of the crowd isn't going to know this song. So are they going to sway to it? How do you mix it with other stuff? You know, if you got the dance floor popping, how do you go into a traditional Portuguese song? You got to, you know, expect to lose some people. You don't do it in the middle of your set. In my opinion, okay, you do what you like. But in my opinion, when it comes to traditional music, it's best in the beginning of your set. Use it as your anchor, Okay. I literally took the two traditional Portuguese songs and I played those right up front right after dinner. So we finished dinner. I started my dance set after dinner. That's what I started my dance set with. Heard that beat coming in slapping. Doom, da, doom, da, doom. Or it wasn't like a reggaeton, but what's that beat kind of go? It doesn't matter. Dinner got done. I said, ladies and gentlemen, the dance floor is now open. I didn't play a slow song, nothing. I just went right into the Portuguese music. Why this works is because, number one, all the family members, all the one, it's a, it's a must play request. So, you know, if it doesn't work great, it doesn't matter. You have to play it. So it's not like, you know, it's like this DJ sucks. Like the, like the couple's not going to look at you like you suck. Like you're playing what they asked them to play. That's super traditional. That's important to them. So worst case, if only 10 people do the dance, you're still, you know, not in hot water. You know, you just, you played what, you know, you played a, a traditional dancing song and you stayed with tradition. You kept the family happy. So have pride in that. Right. But most cases, a large majority of people will get up because whether they know the tradition or not, you want to join in on the traditions. It's fun. You know, when you see people doing a certain dance, like they do with the, with the Portuguese, they, they, they do like a certain kind of dance to it. Like it's like kind of like almost like a line of people and they, that, that, that they do this little, little shuffle thing, right? People join in on that. They have a great time. It always works as an anchor. Use it as an anchor. And then if you want to do some homework, I would listen to the song ahead of time. Get the BPM. Set your cues, right? Like have good cue points of like when to mix in, mix out, things like that. Practice mixing them together. Make sure they flow right. And also practice what songs will be good to mix out of. So these Portuguese songs in particular were in the 100 BPM range. I mixed out with This Is How We Do It by uh, Montel Jordan. And then went into like a little mini hip hop set. And then went into regular more wet wedding music. But like, you know, based on your crowd, everything. Just have a game plan on how you're going to mix out as well. You know, you play most of them. You play most of it. You don't want to mix out quick. You know, have a good, solid six-minute eight minute segment of the traditional music, but then know how you're going to mix out and have a game plan so you can keep the party going after that. And then your dance floor is packed after that. And you start your dance floor with it. You keep it pushing. You knocked out the traditional requests and you're good to go. Okay. The third leg to this is the songs that land in the middle. If the song is cool, but you've never heard of it, you wouldn't play it. You never heard of it before, or you heard it before, but it's like nothing you ever tried on your dance floor, so it's kind of like, ah, you know? This is, these are the songs you mix in the middle. These are the songs where you want to put them in the middle to knock it out as a song request, but you want to have a really, really good game plan. So listen to the song, familiarize yourself with it, re-familiarize yourself with it if you already knew it, add your cue points, figure out what it mixes well with, right? Figure out how you're going to mix into it and how you're going to mix out of it. Because these are songs that you might just play a verse and a chorus or maybe just a chorus to say you played it. So you're going to quick mix out of it. If you're not used to mixing it and stuff, like you want to have a game plan. Otherwise, you're going to get stuck in the song too long. You're going to get that Serato face looking for the next song. Shit, how do I get out of this? Especially if it's bombing, right? Have a game plan. Set up a game plan. Very, very important. If you know how you're going to get in and out of it ahead of time, you're going to easily be able to breeze through playing it. And even if it affects your dance floor a little bit when you do play it, you're going to get out of it quick enough with a banger to build your dance floor back up or to at least hold the people that are still there and then you keep it pushing. You'll be fine. Okay. Being a wedding DJ, you know, you don't play all the stuff you want to play. It, it, we're working for somebody. It's a big part of it. And, you know, you just, as long as you, it's all preparation. If you prepare the right way, you'll get away with playing almost anything at a wedding. Almost anything. You can make any couple happy. Just as long as you prepare. It's very, very important. If you don't prepare, you don't know how you're going to get in and out. 
You get caught with your pants down. But that's how I handle requests, people. You know? It's a very important part of the job. You tell me. You tell me what you do in the comments. You let me know what you like. But that's what I personally do. And, uh, you know, kind of works out. So I want to talk to you guys about all that. So much happened, though. So I have a theory, by the way. I have a theory. And it has to do with churches. Okay? My theory is called the traditional ceremony theory or, or, or TCT to, be, to shorten it, okay? We'll make an acronym out of it. The TCT theory for me is that if there is a traditional ceremony where they're getting married in a church, it's off-site, so it's not like in the same place as the venue, right? It's not like the on-site ceremonies that we almost always do nowadays. If it happens to be a traditional ceremony in a church, people party harder. This is my theory. I should be drinking Pellegrino. I'm going to be burping. <laughs> this is my theory, okay? And I'll tell you why. Let's talk about the timeline. Our normal timeline nowadays for most weddings, okay, is you have ceremony, you go right into cocktail hour, right into reception. Everything's right in a row. It's a five and a half hour timeline, you know, at least where I'm at, but it might be longer, whatever you're at. But generally speaking, right, you have the ceremony on location, you go right into cocktail hour, right in your reception, however long that may be. Okay, with this timeline, you're looking at an hour of drinking prior to the reception where you sit down, you have to watch the formalities, intros, first dances, speeches, and then you go to dinner, okay? So you have an hour of just like hanging out, talking, drinking, conversing, whatever in our, you know, our most usual wedding timeline. But if you go back to the traditional timeline, you see that gap there? I think that gap makes a difference. You tell me if I'm crazy. I had two weddings this weekend without, you know, without ceremonies on location. Two weddings where the couple got married in a church and they hit, they hit different, okay? Because you have a, you know, up to three hour gap between the ceremony and cocktail hour where you could drink. Then you have the hour long cocktail hour where you can drink. And my theory kind of, it's basically because you have so much downtime in between the ceremony and then when you get to the reception, right? So you start cocktail hour and all that. You, you get bored, you go have lunch, you're going to start drinking. You're going to have a couple drinks. You get bored, you're with all your homies, you know, or you're with your friends or whatever, and you go back to the hotel, you're going to drink at the hotel, you know, while you're waiting because you're excited. They just got married, you're like you're pumped up. If you care about the couple, you know, they just got married, it's like, woo, they're married. Reception's coming, it'll be here in no time. You're excited, you're pumped up, you're going to drink. So you have all this time to pregame, essentially. Then you get to the wedding and you have a whole cocktail hour with free drinks. So the theory is, is that more downtime equals drunker guests, equals more twerking, equals better party, equals happy DJ. You know, that's my whole equation. That's the technical equation. I'm putting it out there. This is my TCT theory. And, and, you know, I didn't really pick up on this because almost all my weddings are on location anymore. So, like, you, you almost forget about, you know, the whole traditional wedding thing and, like, what that vibe is like. You almost forget about it. It's, like, 95% anymore. It's crazy. It's, like, almost always. So, to have two out of three weddings this weekend be in a church and then you just see the guests coming in, you know, trickling in for cocktail hour and all that, it, they hit different. I'm telling you. They came in. Everybody's already been drinking. A lot of them already been drinking. And I think it might make a difference. So what does this mean for us if I'm right, right? I mean, you let me know. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe you think I'm wrong, but if you think I'm right, if you think it's a possibility I'm right, what does this mean for us? Not much. I mean, nothing that we need to really change up. Only the fact that, you know, I'm kind of going to look forward to weddings that don't have the ceremony. Yeah, I'm not doing the ceremony setup, so you make a little less money potentially, but I think generally they have the potential to be way better parties. Unless, of course, your ceremony is like two hours away from the reception. 
in those odd instances where like people are literally just driving an hour and a half in between ceremony and uh, and the reception place, and uh, they get there just in time for cocktail hour. People are arriving late because the ceremony was so far away. You know, then that's that's a that's a worst case scenario. But if everything's in the same town, generally. Walking distance is even better. You walk to the church, walk back to your hotel room, walk somewhere to pregame, then walk to reception, that sort of thing. You're kind of set up for a good party, in my opinion. But you let me know what you think. That's my TCT theory. Or, well, TCT for short. TC theory. TC, right? What did I say it was? Traditional ceremony theory. So, yeah, TC theory or TCT for short. Okay, I'm putting it out there, people. Putting it out there. Super dumb. <laughs> That's true, though. Um, I did have a big wedding on Saturday as far as like size of room and guests. One of the larger ones I've ever done and uh, probably the biggest one I had this year. And I thought it would definitely be useful to talk about big weddings with you guys and give you guys some tips. If you, you know, uh, or have one coming up or, you know, if you ever book a very, very big wedding. Big weddings to me are, you know, 250 people plus would basically make 200 you could say 200 plus is a big wedding but 250 plus almost always you're in a very very large area and it's like it's kind of like a whole nother ball game like there's a couple little nuances like to think about a couple little differences between really really big weddings and the smaller ones you know they do have a lot in common it's all about you know two people getting married and love and all that you got similar formalities you play it similarly right it's it's a wedding at the end of the day just with mad more people but there are some things to think about and I want to give you guys some tips on this in case you have any big weddings coming up. So the first thing to think about is you got to use the right equipment. And I'm talking speakers, mics, lighting, across the board, you got to use the right equipment. The old joke, you see memes going around, people saying like, you know, like uh, the, the, the Evolve 50, Evolve, uh, Evolve 50 people, you know, they'll use it at any wedding, <laughs> any venue, no matter how big Evolve 50s cover it, right? You know, it, it, it kind of applies to this. When you have a big wedding, when you have 200 plus, 250 plus people, in my case, you know, I had three over 300 people and it was a very large space, probably 40 foot ceilings. I don't know how big that space was. It was huge. It was very, very big. I think you have to use a minimum. I think any column array setup, okay, like you can't pick on Evolve 50s, like any Evoxes, the LD systems, the JBL, whatever the hell you use, you, you, anything compact will not work. You have to have a bigger system. So in my opinion, if you book a bigger wedding like this, if you don't own dual 18-inch subs, dual, you know, you know, two 15-inch tops, that are powerful too, like not low end, but like generally powerful, then like I would have rent an equipment at the very least. Don't, don't try and do a wedding that's very large with, with not enough sound because you're setting yourself up to fail. If you're not loud enough. And then if you, to get loud enough, your P it sounds like shit. You know what I mean? Like if you, it, you're setting yourself up, sound matters, whether you like it or not, like people realize they don't have to be sound engineers to realize something sounds like shit. Something's not loud enough. You have to be at a certain volume to keep people dancing, to really have people feel the music and all that good stuff. So, you know, when you're going into big rooms, I highly recommend, you know, dual 18 inch subs at the minimum. If you don't, you know, maybe four of them, if they're not super powerful, you know, like just, just know what you need. Okay. And rent it. Don't be, it's no big deal to rent equipment. If you, you know, if you only get one off, what if you happen to most of your weddings, 150, 200 people, right. And you got a perfect setup. Everything sounds great, but you just happen to get this 400 person wedding one time this year, rent the, rent the stuff. Trust me, spend a little extra money, charge them a little extra and rent the right, the proper equipment. That way you're setting yourself up to succeed. Same things with mics and lighting. Lighting, not all lighting is the same. You got those little baby spots. You're not going to see those things in a big room like this, right? I didn't have wedding uh, lighting at this wedding. I, I set up up lighting for no reason, you know, just to make it look good, like right where I was. But actually, they did, didn't purchase any lighting. But still, if you do have lighting, you got to have powerful spots. Your up lighting has to be powerful enough to like, you know, shoot up a 30, 40 foot wall. Things like that. You want to have the proper, proper, proper lights. You can't bring a gig bar to this thing. You know, like a gig bar won't do anything to a dance floor that's like the size of like literally an average venue is like the size of this dance floor. <laughs> it's like insane how big this is, right? So same thing. If you don't, if there's a one-off gig that you got for a person wedding out of nowhere, most of your weddings are perfect. Your gig bar works great. Well, rent the lighting too. If they get lighting, sub it out. Get the right stuff. It's going to make a huge, huge difference. 
Huge difference. You're going to look goofy with subpar lighting. And then microphones. I mentioned microphones just because it's such a big room. What if the toast is on the other side of the room? It could be 200, 300 feet. It could be a whole football field away from your receiver to the toast. So you have to have a robust mic system as well. It's something to consider, you know? Your mic might work great in smaller rooms and stuff like that. But, like, when you're across, you know, you're literally a football field away across the entire room and also past, like, 150, 200, 300 cell phones that are in the room all, you know, bringing a signal, depending on if you're near a metropolitan area, all that. There's so many factors that can, you know, make your mic cut out. If you just have, like, a regular mic system, you don't have anything, you don't have half-wave antennas, you don't have a distribution center, system, things like that, like, you, you, same thing, rent it if you don't have it, okay, you know, or at least, you know, know that you have a robust system that'll go that far, because I've been there, people, I've been there, I've, I've taken the big gigs years and years ago, and then I come, you know, my little, like, Shore BLX 4R receivers with the little, with the little guys, like the size of my fingers, little antennas, you know, and then sure enough, you know, toast happened and I'm holding the whole receiver up like Simba. Just please, please, <laughs> please don't cut out again. Cause everything, you have 300 people, 400 people turn around looking at you cause your mic's cut out. Don't do it to yourself. Okay. Think about this. All right. And I'm not, Hey, I, you know, we all start somewhere, you know, I'm not saying we all need this robust system. It depends what you do, but if you happen to get a gig like this, you're going to need it. There's no way around it. Okay. You, you, the, the, it, it, your mic never cuts out until it does. Okay. So many people with subpar mic setups. Oh, it's great. It works great. Never had a problem until you do, you know, I mean, to me, I'd rather have overkill when it comes to a mic, but generally speaking, definitely think about this when it comes to big weddings. Trust me, trust me, trust me. Um, the second thing is, is when you're setting up, especially with bigger rooms, you got to think about like sound, the acoustics and the aesthetics, right? You want it to look good, but at the same time, more importantly, you want it to sound good, be even across the room. So I think the way you set up your equipment definitely, definitely matters. And I want to show you how I set up mine. If you follow me on Instagram, you saw this, but I wanted to show you how I set up mine and kind of explain why I did so. Okay. So like, if you look at the map, this is the map that the wedding planner sent me. Okay. So this is the whole map. You had a 30 by 30 dance floor. You got 40 tables going around. Um, the bride and groom is dead center, uh, right up top of the dance floor there, uh, uh, on a stage and, you know, and then I'm there to the right. So your first, you know, I think what a lot of us would do, right. Is you would, you know, be DJ and then you would have your two speakers on either side right there. And you play like that. Now, obviously, my first reaction to, to looking at this is like, why am I not in the middle? Why is the couple table not on the opposite side, right in the center there? You know, we should be on the middle, middle, right on the dance floor. That's just how we should set up. And I agree with that. Okay. But sometimes you can't get around it. Sometimes venues are stuck on it. Sometimes couples are, you know, kind of in love with the idea of being the center. And, you know, that's it. You know, that's just, just kind of, this was a situation where like, I, I didn't really push hard because I had an idea on how to set on how to set it up and I'm going to show you what I did and it kind of worked out pretty well. So I didn't like, you know, really, I picked my battles. I was like, why, why, why argue this? Why like go out of my way to kind of fight with them about this? So I didn't, but, um, regardless, if you lose the battle, you end up having to set up in a kind of a weird spot. You know, you definitely, I, in my opinion, you don't want to set up your speakers right by you like that in a big room like this. It's a huge room because now you're super loud for the tables right in front of you. So you can reach the other tables, you know, you want to spread it out. So you're more evenly sounded. So you don't have to blast your stuff as loud, especially during dinner and toast and stuff like that. The more even you have everything spread out, the more even your sound, the, the less loud you have to be, the more happy all the guests are. And no matter where you're at, everything sounds great. You know, that's the goal. I mean, why would you, you know, what's, be, what's better about a house system, you know, anywhere it's because like, it's even, you know, how systems are installed and you have a speaker in every crevice. So like, no matter where you're at in a venue, this, it sounds even like, you know, so the same, for that same reason, you want to spread out your stuff. So what I did was I spread everything out. So instead of being back by the table in the corner, I put all my sound back in the corner. I put my furniture up front. So I'm right on the dance floor. So it's better for pictures. And then also like, so I can kind of like, uh, you know, a better visual, you know, I don't like being so far away from the dance floor, but I spread out my speakers. So it's evenly sounded all the way across. We ran 50 foot XLRs to link them and we just literally spread them out. I actually took a whole video of it so you can kind of see. So again, if you follow me on Instagram, you've seen this, but check it out. And I spread everything out by the way. So I got my furniture here, all our sound stuff back there in this corner, then speaker and then speaker over there. So it's like even around the whole room. 
rather than just having everything right here, I just spread it all out. I figured it'd be better that way. Sounds great. Now you might say that like, you know, having the one speaker behind me, right? I'm going to go deaf, yada, yada, yada. I always have my speakers behind me. It's, it, I do it to a fault. You know, I probably shouldn't, but, um, it definitely made for the best sound. I didn't need a monitor whatsoever. Cause I had one of the stacks behind me. Um, you know, and everything was like nice and even. And even if you look at this picture here, you, you can kind of see, like I put my furniture probably 30, 40 feet away from like my facade and setup, which I normally don't do, but that way I'm closer to dance floor. It looks better for pictures. So you can kind of see the dance floor and then see me DJing. Right. But then also I'm closer. I can like see the crowd. I can see what they're reacted to all that. You don't want to DJ too far away either. You know, and then it looked cleaner because like I utilize the furniture. I can have the furniture anywhere and like there's no bad side to the furniture. Like the backside looks good. But then I kept my facade further back because like the backside of that looks like shit because it's like all my sound and stuff. So if I had that too far up, guests could have like walked behind, walked across like the wires, saw the back of my setup, you know, kind of looks bad. So that's why I kind of separated the two. So definitely consider all that when you're setting up. You know, I, I think it like makes a very, very huge difference. Very, very huge difference. And um, and overall, aesthetically, I think it will spread out even. You can actually see it in this picture where the speakers are. You know what I mean? Aesthetically, it looks good. You know, for microphones and speeches and stuff like that, I don't have to worry about, like, all my speakers being in one corner. So, like, a feedback issue that's all spread out nice and evenly. You generally can walk around anywhere with the mic and be fine, you know. So, it worked out a little better. So, consider all those things. And then... On top of it, the last thing you have to think about when it comes to bigger crowds is reading your crowd in a macro way. Macro rather than micro. What I mean by that is look at the crowd as a whole more than you do looking at individual people. Obviously, always look at like the couple, you know, make sure the couple's having fun and all that. But like try and look at the crowd more as a whole. When you get... When you do a lot of weddings that are like 150, 200, right? Average 100, 150, 200. And then you get to a wedding with like three, 400 people you know, you might tend to still look at the micro, right? Like when you have smaller weddings, you look at like this one group, you know, of people and what they're reacting to and then kind of feed off them and then build off them and keep it going. You might look at, you know, like you kind of like think about it. Like when you're, when you're reading a crowd, right? Like how do you read a crowd? Like you look at little, you know, individual people sometimes, you know, you might like feed off of one person having a reaction, like, all right, I just got to build upon that. Right. I, I do it too. When you have bigger crowds, you don't really want to do that because there's so many people as much anyway, because there's so many people, there's always someone who's going to be, you know, not necessarily turned off, but maybe just like, it's not their favorite song and they might be leaving the dance floor. And there's always going to be somebody entering the dance floor or vibing, you know, just cause there's more people. So there's just more reactions altogether. And if you, you know, approach a bigger wedding and you're looking at the micro and you're looking at everybody's individual reactions, you know, if you're kind of more like, self-conscious and like, you know, kind of feeling like, oh, you know, I hope this song works. You're going to find a lot of people. You, you'll be more likely to find someone that's like not vibing to it. And that can mess you up and be like, get in your head and be like, oh shit, well, it's not working. I got to change it up. You know, you got to kind of like look for the greater good. It, you know, when you play a song, are you having a bigger, greater reaction from everybody, you know, than, than another song, right? Like what's having the, the, the most impact, as a whole to all the people rather than like, wow, like this one group didn't like the song, you know, because there's always going to be that one group when you have 200, 300 people in the dance floor, there's always going to be, you know, you, you, you just, you just got to play majority of the best music, the, the music that the majority likes. Right. And you got to stick with that. Don't get too caught up. Cause I did this weekend on Saturday. It's been a, or a while since I had a wedding this, this big. And I started out and I was like, Oh man, like, I feel like, and cause I'm looking at the edge, you know, and like, I'll, I'll, I'm a, good, good, good. All right. I think I got them. And then I play one song and then like a couple people go off, but they're still partying. But I'm like, man, why do those people leave? And then I'm thinking about those people. I'm like, shit, well, maybe I should have played that. And then I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, wait, no, no macro macro Nick. Okay. Cause like, I'm about to literally change up what I wanted to do. What I, what I, what, what, which in my opinion was a correct play, which actually ended up working. I was about to change that up because I lost a certain group of people. 
You know, you get in your own head. There's just like a lot of like, it's so hard to explain and articulate in the words, but like when you're reading a crowd, there's just so many little factors and so many things you think of. Obviously you guys all know this and like, you just, you want to, you want to kind of just steadfast. You want to just stay moving forward. You don't want to talk yourself out of like really good programming ideas just because a certain amount of people didn't like it or whatever, where like, you got to look at the greater good. Just make sure as long as the majority of the crowd is happy, you're good and keep it pushing. Okay. Don't overthink it. It's very easy to overthink it. That's my only point with that. But those are my tips for bigger weddings, people. Okay. If you have any additional tips, if you do bigger weddings a lot, feel free to leave it in the comments. Let the people know. I'm always looking for tips as well. Um, but generally speaking, of course, big weddings are something to look forward to. They're a lot of fun. You know, when you have three, 400 people, you know, it's not out of the ordinary to have 150, 200 people on your dance floor. I mean, it's pretty cool. You know, it's definitely you know, the more the merrier, you know, the bigger the crowd, the more energy, the more fun it is. So, you know, definitely something to look forward to. But as long as you keep the three things I talked about in check, you know? And, uh, but yeah, the last final thing I wanted to talk about today, we had some big news drop today. I don't know if you guys heard it. Hopefully, uh, you know, it's been blown up all over the internet. So you probably heard of it, but if you haven't, then you heard it here first. Look at this. Huh? Look at it. We got a pioneer S five pioneer dropped a new mixer. Uh, new battle style mixer, the Pioneer DJM S5. Yes, this is not a skin. This is what color it comes in. It comes in red and black. Does it come in other colors? No. But I'll tell you what, Deadpool loves this mixer. He loves it. He's thrilled with the colors. You'll see him at Coachella soon, I'm sure. <laughs> Look at him already. He's already making the hand hearts like the other EDM DJs, right? He's ready to go. I don't know. Uh, so let's go over everything about this. Uh, it's definitely a big announcement. I didn't see this coming. Okay. I, I, I wish I would have saw a leak. I didn't see nothing. You know, so look at that. You know, they, they're, they're keeping after the whole leak of the Rev 7 Pioneer. Tighten, tighten those butt cheeks up. They tighten those butt cheeks up real good. <laughs> they're not letting no leaks out no more. This literally came out of nowhere. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so they released this. It's really cool. Um, basically, it, it's, it's uh, $7.99 total. Uh, for this mixer so it's a super affordable battle mixer and we'll talk about you know all the features and everything first off the colors it only comes in this colors and that's it I'm not a super big fan of uh, black and red I kind of it's like you know I don't know I I guess they're trying to distinguish it from the other battle style mix. you know like if they make it look too much like the S7 or S11 then like you know what's the difference like you want to have like a distinction so like they made this shit bright red so like if you use this you know they want everybody to know that, like this shit you know, this is the S5. This ain't no S7. Because, like, they did, a lot of people don't know, like, you know, I don't know if you guys realize or remember, you know, they had the S3. I don't know if they still make this, but I, I used to own this mixer. This was a great entry-level $500 battle mixer. You had the Magvel fader. So, you know, it, it, it felt great. You had the onboard filter effects. But the problem with this is it had no mini pads, no way to trigger. It had no internal effects, and then it had no way to trigger in, like, even Serato effects or anything like that. So it was just like a, a great mixer to use to practice your cuts and you know learn how to scratch and stuff like that and to, you know it's a good introductory into dvs you know if you wanted to use a pioneer mixer rather than like a dj tech you know with the innovators or the because those are a little cheaper as like an introductory or um the new mark uh what's that new mark thing the pt scratch or whatever which is what i think this is basically competing with so this is like the upgraded s3 so they they put you know it's a little more money three hundred more dollars but they added everything the S three didn't have right you have the pads and you have the effects now they're not onboard effects they do trigger the Serato effects but you have the dongle triggers to trigger them it's an entry level thing so you know I definitely kind of get it two channels that's it there's no extra channels whatsoever you do have the onboard filter so you can you know filter the high pass and low pass filters and whatnot the uh, the effect pads you only have four on each side. But they're super versatile. You can use them, you know, for like the rolls and the you know, like all the different like a lot of the different stuff that they have on like the S7 and, you know, the other controllers too, your SZ and all that. Like it'll have those with the four pads. They're also colored. I believe they're not rubber, though. They're like the cheaper plastic, but I'm sure they're pretty responsive, but they're not going to feel like the S11 or S7 pads. I don't think they're like four of those. They're like a little a downgraded version of those. Um, You can see. You know, it's got basically your mic control and your aux level control up front, headphone jacks, and then your that's your cross fader tightener. So, like, you know, the thing that tightens the Magville fader, I guess it's the same. I'm assuming it's the same as the S11, S7, exact same fader, and you can tighten it there. They have, like, this weird 
kind of clear thing where you can like see through it so you can kind of see how it I don't know why I don't really see the point in this but I mean it's you know I guess it's kind of cool you know if you're just getting into you know entry level so you kind of you know, see see the gears you know kind of see the I mean, it would be cool to make the whole mixer see through, maybe. Like, you know what I mean? If you like it for that. But, like, just this, there's not really much moving either. I don't know. Anyway, that's what's up front. And then if we look at the back, right, we look at the ass end of this thing, you can see we have channel one, channel two, right? So your phono inputs for your DVS with the, uh, with the ground signal thing up top. You do have two legit XLR outputs uh, for speakers, right? So that's very good. You have one mic, but the combo jacks, you have the XLR quarter inch combo jack on this bad boy. So balanced everything. So legit mic. And the, it's just an, um, as far as like volume, it's just like on like, you know, louder. That's it. There's no like low or mid or high like adjustments on the volume. So they did take that out. But again, entry level mixer. I'm sure, you know, it works fine as far as microphone and everything goes. Um, your booth is RCA out. Eh. Again, entry level mixer. And then you have the aux, the uh, RCA aux. So that's all controlled by, um, by the, what you call it. By those two knobs right up front so you can see the side you have the the mic volume knob and then the aux knob right there then you will notice on the back here something a little strange and weird not even strange or weird just new different first of a kind i think first right and that is these usbs usb c's finally they put a usb c on a mixer look at this have you seen this finally usb c's Holy shit. And there's two of them, but there's not two sound cards. So there's two of them. So one goes to your computer and then one, you have the option to plug it into the wall. So it only requires, I think like five volts of power or something like 10, seven volts of power. So you can't use like an iPhone charging block, but you get, you know, anything, right. Anything bigger than like the original iPhone charging block would work to like, you know, power this, but you don't have to you can actually power this mixer via like USB bus or whatever from your computer. So all you have to do is just plug this mixer into your computer and the mixer will turn on and power, which is pretty wild. So that's kind of cool. makes it super portable. Um, I haven't tested it. I don't have this thing, but uh, I did watch Mojack's video and Mojack says uh, there's absolutely no difference. And I trust, I trust what he says. So, you know, that's pretty cool because he would have, he would have found a difference. <laughs> If there was a difference, he would have found it. And he said there's no difference. So that's pretty cool. You know, the fact that uh, I think it's first of its kind. I don't know of another battle mixer, number one, that has. I don't know of any mixer, controller, or anything that has USB-C. Okay, tell me if I'm wrong. This might be the first. I, I don't know one. Uh, definitely not a battle mixer. It doesn't exist for sure. But there may be a controller somewhere. I don't know. But definitely not a battle mixer. And then the fact that it's USB bus powered, like where like your computer will literally power this bad boy. Woo, that's pretty cool. I wonder if that's going to be like a future thing in like future mixers and stuff. Like they're all going to be like USB bus powered. You know, some of us might be a little weary about that, but I feel like if your computer's not like 10 years old, you'll be fine. I think it, it's not going to pull a ton of power. I think you'll be fine powering this bad boy up. No problem. So that's definitely unique. Definitely unique. And for $7.99, I mean, this is what this mixer's for. In my humble opinion, okay, if you're starting out, with turntable is like type stuff. Like if you, if you want to, if you want to get your start on DVS, if you want to learn how to use turntables, if you want to learn how to scratch, but learn how on turntables, like maybe you're an existing uh, DJ and you use controllers and, you know, that sort of thing. But you know, you want to get your start in the DVS world. I think this is a great, great option. You're going to have the same exact faders as the S7, S11. It's going to be super similar. So the whole feel of it, it looks like there's plenty of room to move to. It's not like a crowded mix or anything like that. I believe it's smaller than the other ones, but like, it's not crowded. It's, you know, it's, so it's not like you're going to hit buttons by accident and all that like you would with like a rain one, in my opinion. It seems just super crowded to mix on. So, you know, it, it's got the, you know, you don't need any box. Then again, good thing because they don't make boxes anymore like DVS boxes. So you can't even get them anymore. So <laughs> you plug direct to computer. Um, you know, you, you, you have there's no onboard effects, but you can still trigger effects, everything. So it, it's robust enough where you can bring it out to a gig you know, and do a gig and get your practice in, you know, get your 10,000 hours in with a turntable system. But like, it's still entry level enough where it's affordable. You know, you buy this in conjunction with a couple $500 turntables and you got yourself for under two grand, 
you know, a DVS setup that's super, like, that's going to feel like anything else. And then all you have to really do eventually is upgrade your mixer, you know? So if you really like DVS and, you know, you get good at it and you get good at your little scratches, everything, and you want to switch over to DVS full time, then all you got to do is sell this bad boy. You probably get five, 600 bucks for it and then upgrade to the S7 or S11, you know? So I think it's a great entry level thing. You know, there are cheaper options. If the S3 is still available, you can get that four 500 bucks but you're missing the effects and you're missing the the um uh the what you call the pads uh the new mark option i think is also 500 bucks or 600 bucks so it's that's a little cheaper but the pads are smaller you know and it's a little i played on that new mark thing and it definitely feels like on the cheap side which is i'm assuming this is going to feel a little more you know like the s7 s11 like overall and then you have the dj tech mixers and i think you know I want to go in the middle. If you're just starting out and you want to get your first DVS mixer, I want to go in the middle. I want to go for the S3 or the Newmark, that Newmark scratch mixer. I would either go this one for $799, which would be the top of the line intro, you know, introductory level mixer, or I would go cheaper like DJ Tech, two, three, four hundred bucks. They come with an inner fader, which is like a fantastic, maybe the best fader in the game. And it's limited on, uh, you know, features and all that, but you, you get a great feeder, uh, you get a great fader and, you know, it's just a perfect uh, mixer to hop in and kind of like learn and everything. And then you're only out a couple hundred bucks and then you want to upgrade to the big S11 or S7. You can't, you can do so once you get it down, you know, if you own an S9 and you're thinking about upgrading and you're looking at this 799 price tag, you're like, Oh, this is perfect. I can like, you know, get a new mixer and it's only 799. Don't do it. Okay. You're, you're losing a lot of features. It's not, it, this thing is not no S9 replacement. Hell no. You got to go S7 or S11. Do not replace your S9 with this bad boy. This ain't it. Okay. This is a beginner DVS mixer, but a great one. So I like it. Shouts to pioneer. Shouts to Pioneer. Even though you guys hate me, okay? Still shouts to you guys. It's a great mixer. Something to be very, um, very excited. Something to be very excited about. Except for that color. Not a fan of the red and black. I want to know what the story is of the red and black. I mean, and obviously it's not a huge deal though because you can get a skin for anything. I'm sure, you know, all these companies are making up the skins right now. So you can pop a skin right on that bitch and you're good to go. So you don't have to go with the reds. Don't make that a, you know, I'm, I'm just complaining. Okay. Cause I'm not a huge, you know, this literally looks like Deadpool's official mixer. <laughs> but anyway, definitely cool. Let me know in the comments if you're grabbing it. Um, but that's it, people. I appreciate you for joining me on this beautiful Tuesday. I will be live tonight on Twitch at 9.30. So 9.30 to 11, I'll be DJing on Twitch. You want to come see me live? You want to come see heckle me or ask any questions or say what's up? Feel free to come on by twitch.tv slash Nick Spinelli, which I actually have a thing, don't I? Yeah, there it is. Twitch.tv slash Nick Spinelli. So make sure you uh, come on by to that. But uh, seriously, thank you all for being here, for watching. I love you all. Have a great week. And, uh, you know, crush all your gigs this weekend. Peace out.